This is Tracking the Tropics. All righty. Good morning, Facebook fans. Good morning, app users and website users as well. We are here with the 8 a.m. update from the National Hurricane Center. And uh, Dorian is stronger as of the 8 a.m. update. We now have winds of 145 miles per hour. Uh, that is five miles per hour stronger than the last update. Still a Category 4 storm at this point and still expected to stay a major hurricane through this weekend and into the beginning of next week, we have our featured meteorologist today is from KLFY, Trevor Sonye. Thanks for joining us this morning, Trevor. Can you give us a kind of your thoughts on, on Dorian? You know, you, this is your first time on tracking the tropics here and give us your thoughts uh, on this specific hurricane. Well, of course, it's still looking very strong for this morning. There are two aircraft in there right now. We have a NOAA aircraft that's actually right near the eye wall, and then we have an Air Force aircraft that's in there, and the NOAA aircraft actually pierced the eye about 20 minutes ago, and they dropped what's called a drop on. It measures wind, it measures pressure, all the way down to the surface of the ocean, and actually recorded a, a low a central minimum pressure of 944 millibars, and it recorded a 125 knot wind which would be about 143 miles per hour and that's why with this 8 a.m advisory the national hurricane center has bumped up those winds to 145 miles per hour making it a category four and a strong category four storm and that pressure has dropped about four millibars since the last advisory it really rapidly intensified it last did. night we saw a 20 millibar drop and about a three hour time span and it went from a category two to a category four storm and that's where we are now and it's steadily intensifying it is and uh, again it's about 450 miles there from west palm beach at this point moving pretty slowly though we're moving pretty much due west right now at 12 miles per hour so that's kind of a a slight increase in speed but not really affecting the long term. We're still expecting that slow down as it approaches the Bahamas there and it approaches the east coast of Florida. If you're just waking up with us this morning on Facebook or this app or this website, I know we're streaming to a lot of different stations across the United States. A lot of people tuned in to Dorian right now. Uh, still expecting that slowdown. However, um, we have some better news, I guess you could say, or at least more hope this morning as we get some new model runs in and the trends in these models have shifted a little farther offshore. So Dorian potentially staying off of the East Coast, but that does not mean that the East Coast of Florida at least will not experience these uh, major impacts. Uh, I, I do think the West Coast of Florida, he, us here in Tampa Bay, a lot of folks from Tampa Bay listening and, and watching. Um, I'm reading your comments here on Facebook Live right now. And you know, we, we could be, you know, feeling less impacts at this point with this current forecast. We, we have a lot of time for things to change still. Obviously, we saw things change in the past 24 hours. Maybe we'll see things change for the better or for the worse um, in the next 24 hours. But definitely an interesting kind of situation unfolding with, with Dorian. Right, Trevor? Yeah, it has been interesting. The storm has always been very small in structure, and I think that's sort of giving the models problems. We saw this when it was near Puerto Rico. At first, the models had it going over the eastern parts of Hispaniola, and we thought the mountains would tear this thing apart, where it actually moved well to the east of Hispaniola and actually east of Puerto Rico. We thought Puerto Rico would see a direct hit. It moved east of Puerto Rico, and even in the uh, southwestern Atlantic, models have been all over the place. The speed was a lot faster. A Few days ago and I think that's why models had it going further west actually crossing Florida at times and getting into the yeah. central and eastern portions of the Gulf but models have slowed and now they show that stall and I think that gives that upper level trough a little more time to push eastward and amplify and that's why the models have been trending eastward and that trend has been going on here through about through the past 48 hours or so yeah now that trough is stronger, and now the models are even turning east of Florida, which is all good news. It could still shift back, but the consensus and the trend has been further eastward with both the global models and the ensembles. And now maybe even the Carolinas have to start worrying about this as well. I, I was just going to say, you know, the East Coast may be spared from at least a direct impact at this point with this current forecast trend, but the southeast United States still not out of the clear just yet. We could still see, very well see, a landfall along the East Coast of Florida or possibly southeast Georgia, uh, maybe even into south 
Southeast, you know, South Carolina, North Carolina, those those areas up there is kind of a similar situation to Hurricane Matthew three years ago, where we were looking at a potential hurricane moving up the spine of the state, but then it ended up staying just offshore and kind of hugging the coastline of the Southeast United States. But that is a possibility and also the possibility of it still making landfall. One of um, the National Hurricane Center's models still show it moving on shore this morning. So, um, we're going to watch these trends, but like you just mentioned, Trevor, the, the timing, that trend has been very consistent in slowing down. So we're pretty confident here that, that Dorian will slow down as it moves over the islands uh, of the Bahamas. And unfortunately, it's not going to end up very good for them either way in the northern Bahamas. Yeah, a 10 to 15 foot storm surge there. Uh, of course, category four strength winds in the eye wall. It looks like the Bahamas will take the brunt of this, unfortunately. I would prepare for a Matthew type scenario on the eastern coast of Florida. Some models are even trending further east than that, keeping it some 50, 100 miles offshore, meaning the strongest winds and effects would be well offshore, eastern Florida. But again, the Carolinas, we have to start worrying about that. The strongest surge with this, with the storm moving northward, will be on the northern side of it so we could be talking about a surge for the uh, georgia coast also the carolina coast through the next few days here we're talking about wednesday and thursday of next week so we'll be dealing with this storm through the next four to five days as you said that stall is expected across the bahamas as we head through the weekend and through early parts of next week it won't be moving that much but at least it'll be further offshore model showed it stalling right on the Florida coast a few days ago, and that would have been catastrophic in terms of the amount of rainfall yeah. we would have seen. So all indications are looking much better for Florida this morning, but uh, Florida is still in the cone. Yep. And that's one thing I have to stress. We need to focus on the cone and not that center line. If you are in the cone, you still need to be making your preparations because this forecast has been changing and it still could. It, it absolutely still could. That's why we have that cone. We still have, you know, the potential for error built in that cone. And, um, you know, southwest Florida now out of the cone. So you guys, you know, a little more in the clear at this point. You talked earlier uh, about the Gulf of Mexico not necessarily being a possibility at this point. That that. European model that I see a couple people talking about in the comments. Um, one person said, you know, the European's been right all along. Well, actually, we had several runs of the European taking uh, Dorian into the Gulf of Mexico. And obviously, at, at this point, those are a much less likely scenario. So again, can't lock into one model run, and we cannot lock into um, one model in general. Definitely have to look at kind of the consensus here. Well, I don't feel like any model has really done a good job with this system. Uh, the European had it in the Gulf a few days ago. I was looking at some of the European ensembles and starting to get a little worried here in southeastern Louisiana, but we've seen a huge shift. The GFS was always further east and further north, and now the European and the GFS, they're a little closer to what the GFS was showing several days ago. So none of the global models have really done a great job with this system, but they have been a little more consistent. They have been shifting east. Like you said, it, it, we can't look at a particular model run. We have to look at the overall trend, and the overall trend has been further east with each uh, cycle that goes by here. So, so far, so good. Let's hope it continues further east and even east of the Carolinas. That would be the best case scenario. Let's hope it, it stays offshore of the United States completely. But unfortunately for the Bahamas, I don't really see them escaping this. They will receive the brunt of this. Yep, completely agree with you. And this is, again, KLFY's Trevor's Sonye joining us as our featured meteorologist. And also just joining us right now is Matt DiNardo from, uh, remind me again. WRIC Richmond, Virginia. WRIC <laughs> Richmond, Virginia. He's the morning meteorologist there. He is in Tampa, Florida with us at WFLA, helping us out with these updates right now um, because we're doing a lot of them, right? Every three hours. And Matt, you just walked in the door. Yeah. You're ready to get going. I, Have you even had a chance to look at this 8 a.m. update I, yet. I have seen some of the 8 a.m. update. I was actually just looking at that as well. I mean, you know, I was here last night and we did the 8 o'clock update with JB and it was, you know, 125 miles per hour, a strong Cat 3. And then as soon as we signed off, we got the notification Cat 4. And I wasn't surprised this morning to see it continue to increase. I look at the structure of this on the satellite picture and it's incredible. That eye is so well defined. And as we keep talking about, it continues to slowly slow down over that warm water. More strengthening likely today and uh, again not good for the Bahamas and you know again maybe better for West Florida compared to East Florida. 
completely agree with you. And yeah, that satellite picture right there, that's the infrared satellite. So it's enhanced. We put those colors on the map there for you to show the, the temperatures of the, cl the cloud heights. And those are really uh, cold cloud tops there. And that just indicates that we have a lot of thunderstorm activity going on and a lot of symmetric thunderstorm activity. Just another indication of, of how um, really organized this storm is. So Matt, you can see it's 450 miles away yep. from West Palm Beach right now and only moving at 12 miles per hour. So I'm not going to do the quick math here, but we still got a long way to go. We got a long way to go. So, I mean, that's, and that's all good. But the question is, you know, we keep talking and keep reading the statements from the National Hurricane Center. I think Trevor's talking about this a little bit ago with it slowing down, you know, and that's going to be the key because as it slows down, that's when we start to see some of the wobbles, some of the enhanced effect, and, and also the slowing down may aid in that turn a little bit more north because it allows for the system to take over and slide between the two global high pressures. We're talking about the one over to Texas and the one for the Bermuda High. Yeah, we've been talking about these high pressures a lot lately. Now, Trevor, uh, Matt, you guys can both join in on this, but um, a couple of people this morning on the 5 a.m. Um, chat that I was doing, they, they really wanted to know more about those high pressures and the latest updates on them. So, so talk more about how slowing down right now is allowing that high pressure to kind of weaken. Well, yeah, the high pressure will slowly erode. There's a high pressure across the southwestern Atlantic, which is sort of steering it westward right now. But once that trough begins to move into the northeastern U.S., the western flank of that ridge will start to erode, and it will find that weakness. And that's actually why it's expected to slow down, because it will find the edge of that weakness and start to feel that tug to the north, and that trough will come in and swing it to the north as we head through the early parts of next week. And, of course, the timing of that turn key, and, again, still trying to to determine just how uh, much that ridge, that high pressure in the Atlantic will weaken. Um, and it's again, depending on timing here, the timing of the turn will depend on all of the impacts that the East Coast feels, the West Coast feels, and even the Southeast Coast of the United States at this point. Um, the National Hurricane Center noting that tropical storm force winds still extend out about 105 miles from the center of the storm. And those hurricane force winds um, about 30 miles from the center. So that's each direction. So that's about a 60 mile wide diameter of hurricane force winds. Now, the 145 mile per hour wind there, that sustained wind, probably pretty closer to the center in that eye wall. That's where the strongest of the winds, but of course, hurricane force winds in general, 74 miles per hour or greater, those can do damage as well. So we're talking about a 30 mile difference on either side. And if it's only sitting off the coast, mm -hmm. Matt and Trevor, of about 15 miles we're still going to feel hurricane force winds along the coast. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. For, I mean, you know, last night I saw, and I think it's still going on, you know, the evacuations for uh, the Cape Canaveral area. Um, so that's a big issue already. And, you know, as it slides up the coast, we may see more evacuations along North Florida coast because it's going to hug so tight. And then you have to start looking at Georgia. And if you look at the last period, if, just looking at the line itself in the National Hurricane Center cone, it goes right into Charleston, South Carolina, quote unquote as a category two storm and that's a, a big issue because it wasn't too long ago early 19, 1989 when hurricane hugo rolled right through charleston and that was a major deal that was a cat four uh, charleston all too familiar so when trevor said that high pressure needs to erode the folks in Charleston and we need to road like real quick so it makes right. a harder hook back out to sea. Yeah, and I mean, I can attest to this. People in South Carolina still remember Hugo. I was there. I, I was in Myrtle Beach for a couple of years and people still talk about Hugo there and, and the potential storm surge would be wild with that as well. I mean, Charleston in general deals with coastal flooding on a normal high tide, let alone we're talking about, you know, higher than normal high tides right now, thanks to the moon cycle. Um, just a lot of different factors at play still here. But if you're just joining us, we have over 4,000 viewers on Facebook right now. I am looking at your comments as they're coming in. And uh, thank you. It's Saturday morning. It's Labor Day weekend. A lot of people, you know, probably hope to go on vacation this weekend and, and enjoy the weekend a little bit. But um, a lot of nerves still heightened in Florida. Again, this morning, the latest update, we're seeing that trend farther east away from the coast. Florida still in the cone, though. I want to reiterate that, that we are not out of the clear. We're not in the clear just yet. We still have you know, uncertainty with this. There is a lot of Florida Peninsula still in that cone of uncertainty. But 
Dorian has strengthened this morning. We're seeing winds of 145 miles per hour. And of course, I was watching last night, Matt, you and JB talking mm -hmm. about that pressure drop. Um, and and oh. we mentioned it earlier as well on this stream that was an incredible yeah. pressure drop. Uh, 20 plus millibars in a three hour time period is ridiculous. And that's why we just saw this thing bomb out from the time that we were on in the <laughs> evening at the one, uh, the five o'clock update at 115, then 125, and then not even a few minutes later down to 130. So uh, this thing just, you know, it, it, we kept saying all day, the conditions are right for rapid strengthening. And that was what we're looking at for a, a period where it's just gonna go boom, and that's what happened. Yep, and we are um, potentially going to see this the strength of the storm fluctuate here over the next couple of days as it stays a major hurricane. We talk about those eyewall replacement cycles, um, but as the forecast stands right there, you can see it is supposed to stay at least a four um, moving over the northern Bahamas. Hurricane watches and warnings in effect for there and then potentially move up towards the east coast of Florida. Uh, so... Trevor, why don't we kind of re-go over a lot of people talking about Southwest Florida uh, and, and the West Coast of Florida. Kind of ease people's minds a little bit here and say, you know, this trend is what, what we want to see. Yeah, of course, we don't look at any particular model run. It's good to look at the trends and what the models have been doing over time. And the trend through the past 48 hours here has been an eastward trend. And uh, it was in the Gulf a few days ago. Now the, the models have turned. Of course, they were riding right up the peninsula of Florida about two days ago. And now they're off the eastern coast of Florida. So things looking better for southwestern Florida and western Florida as things are continuing to shift eastward. But unfortunately, uh, things are looking a little more dicey for the Carolina coast, the Georgia coast, as uh, they may actually actually get the brunt of this system now if some of the current models are to be believed. But across the western portions of Florida, things looking a lot better. I would be able to sleep a lot better this morning and uh, sleep in and go ahead with your Labor Day plans. Of course, I mean, if you are still in the cone, you still need to watch. You still need to be prepared. You should always be prepared during hurricane season. But in terms of a direct hit or uh, hurricane force winds on the western side of Florida, you can feel much better that that won't happen. I, I, I agree. Um, we, have, we have one commenter here, Candace uh, Riddle, saying, how strange is it the one little gray line doing on, on the forecast model she's talking about here? It kind of does that loop, right? Um, we have a lot of different models on that we show here, and those are just some of them. That's not all of them. We have, we have quite a few more to be able to look at there. And each one of those models is des designed to look at different things going on in the atmosphere, different things going on in, in compared to past history. Um, and that kind of allows us to see different possible scenarios when each one of those models takes different things into account. Now, are all of them equally reliable? No, there are more reliable ones than others. And certain models are designed to do certain things as well. So, you know, you see that one little kind of strange loop there. Uh, it's pretty much the only one doing that. So we, we kind of know that that's a little bit of an outlier. And, and as a meteorologist, we can kind of count that out at this point unless we see more uh, models starting to do that. So kind of a little bit of a meteorology lesson for you guys out there uh, watching on Facebook. But Well, yeah, I was looking at that. That's actually <laughs> a steering model. Okay. And you have a steering model for a shallow system, which is a weaker system, and you have steering models for deeper, stronger systems. Uh, we're talking about a Category 4 hurricane, so this is obviously a, a deep system. This is not a shallow, weak system, and that's a steering model for a shallow system, so you can pretty much throw that one out. There we go. Even better. Yeah, you can. There, each, each of those little lines has a little code, and they correspond to that specific model, and again, they each do their own thing. They're supposed to each represent uh, something in particular. So um, thanks again, everyone, for joining us. Of course, we have people saying, you know, WFLA always does a great job in keeping us informed, and that's what we're here to do. You know, we've been with you through this whole week, giving you guys updates on Dorian uh, from when it was just supposed to be nothing to maybe a potentially a tropical storm making landfall in Florida and now potentially a major hurricane making landfall somewhere along the East Coast. And uh, we just want you guys to be prepared. You know, when, when someone sees... A potentially a major hurricane is going to make landfall. We see a lot more people react and, and that's good, but we just want to everyone to keep in mind that these are very hard to predict. Uh, we're, we're doing our best here and there's still a lot of uncertainty, but waking up to again, some slightly better news heading into 
Saturday, the first day of the Labor Day weekend. You know, when I, when I keep watching the, the, the different graphics that we have cycling through here, you know, I'm looking at the comments here. A lot of people asking, you know, what about the rainfall for Sarasota? What about Miami? So when you look at the, the cone of uncertainty, Miami's completely in the clear. That doesn't mean you put your guard down yet because we are still looking at, you know, a, a very strong catastrophic storm near the Florida coast. And all it's going to take is one jog of this to move southwest, and it brings the southern part of Florida back into play. So let's put that out there for those worrying about South Florida and beyond, let's say, south near Miami or even the Keys, just in case. Just watch it, but right now you're looking better. Now, for the west coast, Florida, Sarasota, people are saying how much rain. Uh, it all depends on how close this system gets. Yesterday when we were showing the rainfall amounts, we were looking at west coast Florida uh, seeing about one to three, maybe three to six inches of rain as you got a little bit more inland, but that was with it coming into the I-95 corridor. Now that it's along the coast, again, just looking at the straight line itself, you're lessening that effect. So maybe the west coast of Florida is one to two inches of rain, not as much. Maybe a you know typical downpour from a great thunderstorm that happens during the summer afternoon here. So don't worry so much right now about the rain. If this track holds, we're going to be okay in the west coast of Florida, including Sarasota area. Yeah, but the east coast of Florida, even if we don't see landfall, even if, you know... A whole different scenario. Right, yeah. exactly. Dorian travels up the exact center line of the current cone, which probably will not happen. Right. Um, something else will happen. Something probably in the cone, but, you know, uh, that center line, not, not necessarily likely. But say it does say stay right off the coastline we're still talking about significant storm surge impacts uh, north of where that storm you know is is going and we're still talking about hurricane force winds coming on shore as well as a lot of rainfall but if the storm stays off the east coast uh, like matt was just saying less likely in terms of a significant rainfall event, but we're still talking about a slow moving storm so lots of factors at play a couple people in the comments asking about georgia Correct. Georgia's still not in the clear, nor is South Carolina at this point. Um, all depends on timing, how, how fast Dorian is, is going to move. So just kind of recapping everything here for you. This is the latest, the 8 a.m. update from the National Hurricane Center. This was an intermediate update, so we just got uh, those that strength update, the pressure update, the hurricane hunters in the storm right now, they did uh, kind of punch the eye, if you will, and, and they found stronger wind speeds in the in the eye wall. They found 145 mile per hour winds. And so we're, we're upgraded, still sitting at a category four, um, and the storm still, still looks very healthy at this point, but still very far away, still plenty of time. There are watches and warnings in effect for the Bahamas, uh, hurricane watches and warnings, meaning they will likely see impacts within 48 hours, but still no watches and warnings in effect for the state of Florida, which means we're still at least 48 hours away from any sort of impact here. Uh, but. What else, guys? Well, you know, we, we've been tracking this storm right. for, for a long time, and it's just been very interesting to kind of watch unfold. Dorian's been a, a different kind of storm. Yeah. Um, well, one thing I would like to say is that uh, sometimes on social media, uh, you'll see these weather pages, and I'm not really here to bash weather pages, but sometimes they'll they'll try to scare people. They'll post one model run that shows a Category 4 storm moving into a certain area. And one thing I would like to emphasize, especially in this type of scenario, is do not focus on one particular model run. Focus on the model consensus, the model trends. Uh, sometimes on social media it goes crazy during times like this where you'll see those images of, of one model run. And you just have to be careful for that. Make sure you go to trusted uh, news sources, uh, your local weather stations, your local news stations, and the National Hurricane Center, of course, uh, to get your information. And just uh, don't buy into some of that clickbait that you may see uh, going all over social media and, and things like that. I know people get very scared, you know, as they should be in this type of scenario. And I just want to uh, ease some people in terms of that. You just 
be very careful about the information you take in. Trevor, I, I couldn't agree. Completely agree, agree yeah, right? I mean, I, I call <laughs> Simultaneously. It, I always say, you know, know your source. What's your mm -hmm. source? Because some of these weather pages I say is somebody in their mom's basement and they're maybe, you know, a, a young kid who's aspiring to be a meteorologist and just learning about the models. And so that's what he's posting. Look what I just saw. Well, great. But did you look at the 60 other models that show something completely different? And you're right. It, it is very. So I always say, know your source. What is your source? Who are these, uh, you know, authors behind the pages? Where are the faces on TV, on digital, talking with you? We've gone to school. We've studied this. So we, we have, you know, not so much, I don't want to say the, the upper hand, but a little bit more background knowledge as to what goes on in these systems, how they track, how they form, what we're looking for. So, yeah, great, great point, Trevor. And one thing to add to that, yes, you want to look for those verified sources. Of course, the, the blue little check marks help help out a little bit there. But even if you are looking at your verified source, your local meteorologists, your, you know, your local news station, look at the timestamp too of that article or of that post because that will be key. You may think you're doing uh, something great by sharing that verified source's post, but if it's even a day old, but sometimes, you know, in the, in the streamline of Facebook and Facebook's timeline, we get updates that come in that are two days old at some point. And, and with something that's so time sensitive, like this hurricane, when we see changes every single three hours, you want to make sure you're sharing the very latest information. That's kind of actually why we like to stay on this Facebook Live, answer your questions for so long. We know that, you know, 6,000 of you aren't watching for 45 minutes or an hour, and maybe some of you are, and that's great. But uh, some of you are hopping off and hopping back on. And the longer that we're live, the most up to date we can get you the information that is current, the 8 a.m. advisory, you know, the 11 a.m. advisory. Uh, so, so just make sure verified sources and make sure that timestamp of whatever you're sharing is also good, most great, recent. Great question here from Ashley Lorano. I think the name is, um, you know, when is the next update? So let's just run through this. We get really important updates at 5 a.m., 11 a.m., 5 p.m., and 11 p.m. Those are the times that we see a change in the track, a change in the strength in the track. That's the major update. And then at 8 o'clock uh, a.m., 2 p.m., uh, 8 p.m. and 2 a.m. are position updates and also sometimes, you know, wind speed updates, but not a change in the track. Now, as, as uh, Amanda said, we are constantly now, because this is so close, 450 miles away from the east coast of the United States, we are constantly flying hurricane hunters, not we, but the National <laughs> Hurricane Center, into Dorian and getting more and more readings. And that's what happened last night. We did the 8 p.m. update. They were still flying hunters in. Hunters came back with an even stronger wind field, and so that's when they put out that um, special update at just before nine o'clock saying that it's now a cat four 130 miles per hour so but the main updates are five eleven five and eleven and then eight two eight two are your intermediate updates with just updates about the storm the position and the winds Right, and we have a couple of questions. Uh, uh, Lindsay says, Amanda, in its current state, what does this mean for Central Florida? Uh, again, still significant impacts potentially for Central Florida, not out of the woods just yet. You could still be experiencing at least hurricane force gusts, if not sustained winds there. Um, lots of good questions coming in right now on Facebook. And, and like Matt said, you know, we're not flying into the storm, but we're, we're all working together at the this point. The meteorological community is the we. We are. And, 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 you know, over the past several days, I've, I've been watching the Facebook Lives and I've been watching um, the comments coming in. And a lot of people saying, you know, well, why is your forecast different from, you know, another stations or the weather channels or something like that? But if you really pay attention to the details, I think we're all trying to pass along the same message. You know, no one can pinpoint where exactly Dorian's going to go at this point, but we're trying to get you guys to prepare, not to be worried, but we want you to be safe in case this major hurricane does a lot of damage. Frank Snow just asked, hey, Matt, uh, how often are the weather models updated, not the one that's the National Hurricane Center track? Uh, Frank, let me answer that question. Uh, uh, they're updated all the time. We have um, different runs at different times. We have some that come out. Uh, this is East Coast, so 8 o'clock in the morning is when you know we get the balloons going up, so they start coming out around 10 o'clock in the morning. Then there's some that come out around noon, some at 2 o'clock. And then there's really high-resolution, very short-range models that come almost hourly. And so we have lots of different models. When we show the spaghetti charts, 
that's that's a mixture of many different models coming out at different times. But we, we kind of use a little bit of a uh, an example here. Those come out roughly at, let's say, 10 o'clock and then 2 o'clock and then, you know, maybe around uh, 8 o'clock or 6 o'clock in the afternoon. So there's, there's a medley of different times when we show these spaghetti models. Those are constantly being updated the whole time. Yeah, and Trevor, maybe you can answer this. And we've had a couple people ask about, you know, the increase in forward movement now. We were at 9 miles per hour, then 10, and now we're at 12 miles per hour. A couple of people asking, you know, well, I thought we were expected for it to slow down. Maybe kind of explain the, the process that we're, we're going to see here. Yeah, it's still being steered by that high pressure off to its north, so it will continue to work westward. The stall is expected as we head through tomorrow and Monday. It will find the weakness in that ridge. Sooner or later, that trough will begin to work in, and that ridge will begin to erode, and when that happens, it will begin to slow down because it will sort of be deciding where to go. It won't be able to go westward anymore, but the trough won't be strong enough to pull it northward yet, so it'll sort of just sit there, but then once that trough really swoops down, and the trough has been getting stronger and stronger on each consecutive run which is certainly good news it looks like that trough is now able to pull it off to the north as we head through uh, Tuesday and but then as we head through Wednesday and Thursday we have to watch across the Carolinas I'm hoping that the trough is strong enough to just push it completely eastward and it doesn't hit any uh, part of the United States that would be the best case scenario Right. A couple of people asking about airports. Wayne McGraw wants to know, you know, Tampa Airport, will it be open again Thursday morning at 5 a.m.? I don't even know if there are official Ta closures for Ta Tampa yet. Tampa is not closed. I think uh, MCO is the only one that is closed. I think they closed Monday. Monday. Yeah, so that's the only one. But Miami right now is still open. Tampa is still open uh, for the duration, unless we hear differently. So only Orlando is closed on Monday as a precautionary measure at this point. And the airports have their own set of meteorologists. They are, are doing their own thing. We don't control when they decide to, you know, open and close and which flights they decide to cancel. So that's something to really keep an eye on with that airport, with that airline as well, because there will likely be flights affected from this no matter what. A uh, question came in um, from a viewer in uh, Highlands County. Should I be boarding up my windows? I would not be boarding up yet. It's a little still too early because the track is, again, along and slightly off the coast. Again, we're still in that cone of uncertainty, but I think you have time to wait it out at least another day before we tell you, hey, it's time to board up. So Highlands County residents, inland residents from Tampa, uh, you're good right now to go about your normal life, but still be very aware of the weather at this point. Stacey's saying, will we get hurricane watches in all of Florida? And the answer to that is, is no, not all of Florida is going to see a hurricane watch. Um, and again, those watches and warnings are issued based on the time frame out. So we'll start with probably tropical storm watches and warnings um, 48 hours prior to tropical storm force winds being set on there. But um, not everyone is going to experience hurricane force winds in this case. So the entire state will likely not. But um, within 48 hours, that's when we'll start to see those watches and warnings warnings being issued. A uh, question came in. Will we have another scenario like this in September? Um, it, yesterday, we were watching a wave that came off the African coast. And uh, by the time it went to uh, the afternoon update, the tropical, uh, the National Hurricane Center said it was uh, probably about a 40% chance of development. I'm actually just pulling this up right now. That was one thing I didn't check this morning. Oh, looky there. They <laughs> now have it at a, I think that's a 60% chance of development uh, off of the African coastline. And so I'll just show you my phone here. I know this is crude yeah, but what I'll, I'll we're looking at there is uh there we go is that that area um boop, 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 back up there <laughs> uh, right there coming off the African coastline. So, yikes, we'll have to be watching that. But here's the key. That is so many days away. That could turn out ahead of the ridge, stay out in the open waters of the Atlantic, move into the central and northern Atlantic. But yes, there is more that we are watching beside Dorian. Oh, and by the way, I, my screen just went dark there. We had on a meteorologist <laughs> from Brownsville last night, and he was talking about something in Texas, and we got that going maybe into the Yucatan at a 20% chance or 10% chance of development there. So yeah, this is the active time of the year, usually from uh, mid-August through the end of September. It's our peak climatological time where we see a lot of development out in the Atlantic, Caribbean, and Gulf. And here we are right in that. And we're looking at Dorian and two potentially other systems that certainly bear watching at a minimum. Uh, a couple of people asking about, you know, is it safe to go on the water this weekend? Again, 
Labor Day weekend. People want to, you know, get outdoors and, and enjoy their their weekend there. Trevor, kind of talk about when, at least the West Coast, I think they're asking about the West Coast here, Sarasota, uh, Fort Myers, Naples, are you safe to go fishing? Let them know that they're okay at this point. Yeah, I would just monitor the forecast. I think you're okay on the west coast of Florida. Uh, East coast, totally different story. Continue to monitor uh, that forecast through the next few days for sure. Uh, Just to see, again, 50 miles in either direction will make a huge difference. And then on the east coast, you'll have that uh, easterly fetch coming in of water. So I'm sure uh, tides will start to run above normal and that water will start to come in uh, with those, uh, those easterly winds and that long fetch coming in. Uh, from that storm off to the east so the east coast i would say no west coast i think you'll be fine and and sj um kind of just asked can it cause a tsunami no (laughs) (laughs) do you want to explain what a tsunami is there trevor to ease people's uh (laughs) fears yeah explain the difference between storm surge and tsunami there yeah, a tsunami is, is caused by a, a large island collapsing or an earthquake or, or something like that. A, a storm surge is a slow and steady rise, but uh, it, it acts the same in terms of the water rising. When you have 10 to 15 foot storm surge, uh, of course, it could come in and be devastating, but it's more of a gradual rise. It's not a, a full fledged tsunami. Uh, I saw this movie, I forgot what it was called, when they had the earthquake in California. Uh, San Andreas, and they had this big 100-foot tsunami that came into the city, and it, it won't be like that, I promise. Good to know. <laughs> um, Eddie's <laughs> saying, have you ever held a sheet of ply- plywood in strong winds? Good luck. Be prepared. Um, there's kind of something to note there. Yes, we do not want you to be putting up your hurricane shutters when those tropical storm force winds start, uh, which is why, you know, we issue the tropical storm watches and warnings. That's when you should start putting your plan in place. You know you have 48 hours to get all of that stuff done, which preparing your house shouldn't take 48 hours. So um, we do not have those in effect at this time. So shutters a little too early at this point. Somebody keeps uh, mentioning from central New York and so am I a long time ago. So hello to you Uh, going to Disney in October. Don't worry about Dorian ruining any plans for your Disney uh, in October. As you can see there by the timestamp, we're talking something that's going to be affecting Florida this week. You're going in October. You have 30 days. We should be fine for your trip to Disney in October. Although we will be talking about Dorian for what feels a very long time. Exactly. October is even longer away, so you should be good there. (laughs) Dorian's still around in 30 days. I quit. Right? (laughs) I think there will be a lot of meteorologist openings across the country. (laughs) Um, Michelle says what kind of wind should we expect in Vero Beach again the east coast of Florida not out of out of the clear here at all looking better of a situation right now with hopefully the center of Dorian not coming ashore but you will still likely experience those hurricane force winds Uh, Vero Beach is right along the coast there and you can still experience hurricane force winds as, as well as stronger even stronger gusts the sustained winds right now 145 miles per hour that's a category four but the National Hurricane Center noting that there are higher gusts so a sustained wind is different than than a brief gust a lot of people of course still continuing to ask you know uh something about what is that gray line that's looping around and as trevor (laughs) talked about that is one of the models that are used for what we call shallow or very small less intense uh tropical systems uh this is far from a shallow or less intense tropical system so ignore that line but that's one of the many models that we use in the spaghetti charts uh spaghetti plots to kind of give us an idea of the trend of where things are headed to so that is an outlier as amanda said earlier as the meteorological community we look at that and we go nope that's not something we need to worry about so it's not going to loop around florida and and do something crazy like that yeah and trevor said earlier too that that specific model was designed for a shallower tropical uh cyclone and obviously dorian is a much larger a much deeper tropical cyclone there so um not not likely a, a scenario, as, as Matt and Trevor said. Uh, one question we, we did get asked about red tide. Now, red tide was a very big problem along the West Coast last year. Um, we, we really have not seen much of it this year, which is good. But hurricanes tend to mix up the water a lot. They bring a lot of um, colder water up from the bottom. And sometimes that can help mix out some of that algae, bringing in some cleaner water. But at this time... We, we still are looking good. We really don't have any effects from red tide at this point. 
a caution came in to try to take the tarp off our roof. Um, I don't know why you have a tarp on your roof. Are you getting work done? We get thunderstorms uh, pretty much every day in Florida, so uh, maybe we'd keep that on until you get you know your your work done on the house. Or roof I know. Tarp. I know. Unfortunately, a lot of our our viewers out in Polk County still are dealing with the effects from Irma, mm-hmm. um, and they still have some some tarps on their roofs. So uh, that's kind of the unfortunate scenario where we have active or at least active for one specific area multiple seasons in a row um and you know people aren't done healing yet that's why people in um you know mexico beach panama city they were kind of worried at those couple of european model runs but um hopefully the center of the storm will stay a little farther offshore and we won't have to worry about as strong of a winds here in the tampa bay area not sure where where you're at there but Just continuing to look at, let's update people who are just joining yes. us um, as you're just uh, waking up this morning, maybe just tuning in. Uh, here's the latest, again, 145 mile per hour winds, a very strong category four storm moving to the west at 12. You see that at the top of the screen. As Amanda put that line on, roughly about 450 miles from the east coast of Florida. We are expecting uh, that turn that we talked about yesterday to happen based on the newest model trends. You've been seeing the forecast cone, which is coming up here, and you've also been seeing the uh, spaghetti charts. When you look at this forecast cone, w- many people, I do it a lot too, I focus on that center line, which is the official track. But we always have to remember the red shaded area is your area of uncertainty. That's when you take in all these models, you see them out to the east, so that's our outside build, and then they also build it to the west because we've seen this before where the storms can shift a little bit left and right as they move up north, and that could be a factor. So there's a lot of uncertainty still in the exact location of which this will be, but we are certainly getting a better feel that as Trevor mentioned earlier, the high pressure to the north is going to weaken a bit, allowing for that turn to come on up. And then the question is, what happens North Florida? What happens Georgia? What happens South Carolina? Because one of the things we're looking at, as Amanda correctly stated earlier, uh, you're still going to have the onshore winds, the onshore flow, which is um, heavy flooding into the intercoastal waterways of North Florida, Georgia, and South Carolina. Therefore, you're going to have um, you know flooding potential. You're going to have beach erosion. And we're still looking at a storm even if it rides up along the coast that is going to have hurricane and tropical force winds uh, for central and north Florida, uh, maybe as far as western Florida up to the north and uh, certainly then into Georgia and South Carolina. So there's still a lot of factors that need to be worked out. But looking at this again, signs are slightly better this morning as they slightly got better yesterday for the Tampa Bay area and point south. And Matt, too, we had one question about the black lines that you and I were talking about earlier on the forecast models, right. or at least we were talking about yesterday. Explain yep. what those black lines are. The black lines are drop shadows. Um, <laughs> we'll have to go in and remove those because it They're looks like this is... a little bit is, of an effect. <laughs> yeah, it, uh, because we have the... It, it's a graphical thing. So, yeah, we'll, we'll need to maybe adjust those because they do look like, oh, there's 75,000 more things. No, those are, um, those are shadows, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Tom asking about the millibars are getting lower. Trevor, explain the relationship between pressure and maximum sustained winds. Well, as the pressure gets lower, the winds will begin to increase. And I think one thing that's helping this storm intensify is the uh, evacuation of mass aloft. And what that means, you have good upper level outflow. You have air that's uh, moving in all different directions very quickly aloft. And when that happens, it leaves a void. So air has to rise in order to fill that void. And when that happens, you get a lowering of pressure because air is working northward and it's leaving that area. So you get surface pressures that lower, but the atmosphere doesn't like that. So you have winds that have to come in to fill that void. And of course they start rotating. So when that, that's sort of the thermodynamic and the, uh, the kinematic process of a hurricane. But when that happens, as pressures lower, those winds are coming in faster and faster. You can almost think about it like marbles on a floor. If you have a low spot on the floor and you throw a bunch of marbles on the floor, they're all going to go to that low spot. And winds sort of do the same thing in the atmosphere, especially in a low pressure area. So the lower the pressure, 
pressure, the stronger the winds will be. And that's why uh, as we see those pressures dropping at the surface, those winds are, are getting stronger. And unfortunately, that could continue for today. I would not be surprised to see a Category 5 at some point in Dorian's life cycle. Hopefully it's uh, sooner rather than later when it starts getting closer to the land areas. Right. Yeah, I was actually talking to one of our digital producers last night about that. You know, she asked me if, if I thought it was going to get to a five and and the answer is possibly. Yeah, it definitely could. But maybe not necessarily at, at landfall. It's going to change in strength here, especially with a storm as organized as this. It is going to go through those eyewall replacement cycles, which are, are almost nearly impossible to predict right now, at least you know, over the course of three days, we can start to show signs of it and maybe start to guess when the cycle is beginning. But um, that kind of changes the intensity um, up and down just a bit. Just reading one of the uh, statements here. I'm sorry, Trevor, I, I just want to cut you off for a quick second. Um, th this morning, the eye itself was only 10 to 15 miles wide. It's a very tight eye. And, and when Trevor was talking about that void, the lower pressure, the stronger the storm, the lower the pressure, the tighter and smaller the eye is. So that's um, something pretty interesting there. Uh, you know, you look at major storms, those eyes have been very, very small, and then all the power surrounds it uh, with that air rushing on it. And Trevor, go ahead. You were going to say something. I was basically going to say the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> Explaining just uh, how, how small the eye is and how those winds are rushing in. So you pretty much said it for me. <laughs> Sorry. A <laughs> <laughs> couple people asking about Gainesville. We had a, a comment earlier. Is the Gator game still on tonight? There is actually no Gator game tonight because we played last week. Um, but Gainesville in general, uh, you guys could still experience effects from Hurricane Dorian. Uh, even if it sits off the coast, you'll likely see those tropical storm force winds moving well inland. They do extend out 105 miles from the center of the storm at this point. And even if the storm sits off the coast right there, like you see on the track, uh, 105 miles it can still extend pretty far inland. So impacts are still possible, especially for uh, central and north Florida. People uh, keep saying, uh, but what about the Euro model? What about the Euro <laughs> model? That seems to be the thing. Uh, folks, the Euro model is a, is a very good model. Nobody's going to argue that, but it is not a flawless model. There are a ton of models that we look at, and there's a ton of models that the National Hurricane Center looks at. So as Amanda said earlier in the week, the European model had this going uh, between Florida and Cuba over the Keys and then coming up into the Gulf. Obviously Possibly that's, affecting Trevor. <laughs> yeah, obviously that's not the scenario we're looking at here. The GFS earlier in the week had this thing curling up to the sea, out to sea. Uh, so again, they, they, they are ideas. They have different equations built into them. Everything that we do in weather is based on math and physics. That's pretty much all it is. Um, and, and, and then those models help us get an idea as to what the tracks may be. Now, as we get into a shorter time frame, some of those models are a little bit better. Some of them get a little bit worse. And then there is better models that we can introduce in that shorter time frame, which are even high, more highly accurate. So again, don't just keep saying Euro, 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 because there's a plethora of models that we look at. And that's what we're talking about this morning when we show, again, these tracks, these spaghetti charts. And kind of uh, Rigo in the comment section there saying the Euro model um, has a lot of times been a reliable model, but the American model has improved with the new system. Yes, that, the GFS was recently updated not too long ago, and we have seen great improvements with it uh, just in the past couple of months here. Yeah, we have. Uh, I still believe that uh, the European model is uh, sometimes a, a little more accurate just because it has a longer track record, uh, but the GFS is definitely getting better with that newer update. Uh, I have noticed that the GFS has always had a, a poleward bias, meaning that it tends to turn storms uh, a little sooner than predicted. It usually has troughs a little stronger. Europeans opposite. It, it builds ridges more, and sometimes it tends to be further west. We saw that with this one, though. This this storm really showed the biases in the models. The European model had it going west to the Gulf. GFS has always been further off to the east, and now it looks like the GFS from a few days ago might actually be a little closer to what could happen. And that would have been a sooner 
prediction that was more accurate, right? So again, never lock in on one model. Lots of questions coming in about tornadoes. And anytime you have a, a tropical system near land, you are likely going to see some sort of effect and potential for tropical uh, spin-ups of tornadoes. Those may be be in the form of water spouts moving ashore. In this case, especially if the center of the storm sits offshore, sits just off the east coast, they would likely be water spouts moving onto the east coast because most of the time you see uh, tornadoes form in the northeast quadrant of um, the right front quadrant of the hurricanes. And in this case, it will be the northeast quadrant because it's going to be moving to the north. So, yes, tornadoes are, are possible. Somebody asked, when is the next update? We just went through this a few minutes ago. You're probably just joining us. We get that because people are waking up at different times on a beautiful Saturday morning here. Uh, we are looking at that next update to come in at just before 11 o'clock uh, this morning. So, and that'll be a big update because that'll change uh, the track as the newer models come in. That'll also give us a new position on the storm. Uh, winds and just the whole slew of that cone that we look at will be altered based on the newest information. Sheila asking, um, you know, when are we going to go off of Facebook and possibly off the air? I know a lot of times when we have land falling tropical systems in a certain area, your local news stations will go wall to wall coverage is what we call it. You know, that 24 seven coverage, um, depending on where, you know, Dorian ends up tracking. We have a plan in place here at WFLA to continue coverage. Um, but she said that her area might possibly lose power. And I think we're going to continue at least to the WFLA now updates uh, on tracking the tropics here at least every three hours, as long as someone is in the path of this storm. So no worries. You can continue to tune in with us. And, you know, if, if there are some people in the comment section that are saying, you know, we're just here to hype up the storm or we don't have any new information. Why are we on here? Well, a lot of people just like to see the latest information from the Hurricane Center. You know, we did have new information at this point. We had the wind speeds increase. So um, regardless, we're going to be on here giving you guys the updates every three hours as they come out. Yep, it's our uh, it's our job. <laughs> That's why we're here. Uh, we're here to protect and and serve the community, and we're here to also ease people's worries. Uh, people are really scared of weather, and that's one thing just in my career. It's only been five years, but I'm learning that more and more. Uh, people are really fearful of, of bad weather, and uh, sometimes you, you really become a comforter as well as a meteorologist on air because if you speak with the, an intelligent but a calming voice, you can really calm, calm you know, people's fears. And that's one thing I try to do for sure. Uh, I don't try to hype things up. I certainly do not want to do that. I want to ease people's fears. Uh, that's one mission that I try to do every day. You know, I always say, Trevor, and I think this goes along with what you're talking about, don't fear weather, but respect it. Understand the power, but also understand that you can do certain things to always protect yourself and uh, to protect your family and your, your, you know, your property as well. So um, whether it's, you know, tropical systems or tornadoes or, you know, if you live in the northern part of the country and you get into blizzards and snowstorms, there are, there are simple things you can do. Always respect the weather, always understand its power and just, you know, do the right things, listen to what we're talking about, heed those warnings, and you're going to be fine. You know, you really are. And listen to local authorities when they do evacuations as well. Right. I, I can 100% attest to that. I did not always know I wanted to be a meteorologist. I was terrified of weather as a kid. Um, I grew up in Florida and we had thunderstorms every single day. Uh, eventually, I learned a lot about weather and now I absolutely love it. So the more you know, usually the less... Um, scared of it you that you are because you, you know what's going on you can kind of understand oh, what's happening and it's helpful to understand that so I'm looking at the latest satellite images mm -hmm. the last few um, kind of frames that are coming yep. in and, and we're not seeing quite the symmetric storm that we were the past 12 hours we're kind of seeing a little bit of erosion there or at least a wobble maybe on the western side what do you guys think about that that last frame. Yeah, I see, I see what you're talking about there. And, and I don't know if that's, you know, maybe the the last part of the trough that Trevor was digging, uh, talking about maybe digging in uh, and giving a slight steering current. And then after that, we're going to see uh, more of a jog, maybe slightly northwest. Uh, you know, Trevor, what's your what's your thoughts there on that? You see what Amanda was talking about? Yeah, uh, the erosion on the western side. I was actually looking at that to seeing, see if there was a little bit of a – maybe westerly shear that was coming in, maybe just enough to sort of erode that, that western side. 
there. I don't think it would be enough to really weaken the storm, but that might be why it looks a little flatter on the western side. As you can see on the satellite, you see this outflow and all those rain bands on the eastern side, but the outflow is uh, sort of reduced on the western side. And sometimes that could happen if you have a little bit of wind shear coming in. So that's sort of uh, what I was looking at. I don't really see much, but uh, it could be a little bit of a westerly shear coming in, and that could be enough to limit that outflow uh, on the, the western side of the system. I'm actually looking at models right now to kind of see what's going on. That upper level low that's uh, situated across the Yucatan may be importing some sort of a uh, northwesterly shear on the system. It's very weak, but it may be just enough to sort of, uh, again, limit that outflow on that side. Something to keep an eye on here over the next few hours anyway. It may not have any effect in the long term, but just something, you know, as a meteorologist, again, we kind of keep an eye on these things over, you know, every hour yeah, that we're we stare in at this even thing the whole time <laughs> that's right. what we do even when we're not in you know we're kind of working on 12 hour shifts some of us here and even when we're not here that's what we're looking at <laughs> but uh you know that's how we see the storm evolve you start to notice little changes like that and those little changes yeah. can sometimes affect the changes in the long term so um we'll be watching it but just something that we were checking out So we still have over 2,000 viewers on Facebook right now. We are coming up on an hour of our newscast. Again, we, we assume that people are hopping on and hopping off here. This was the latest advisory from the National Hurricane Center. This came in just before 8 o'clock this morning. Dorian was a little stronger. We're still looking at a cat Category 4 hurricane. And... Uh, Again, the latest trends as of this morning still kind of making its way towards the east, farther east. We saw this beginning last night. Didn't know if we could really trust it just yet, but we've seen several model runs since then be a little farther east. So uh, we are going to continue to watch this today. Vinny says, hey, Amanda, how wide is the storm from end to end? Well, at least the tropical storm force winds, that's kind of uh, the major area of the storm. Those winds extend out 105 miles from each side from, from the center there. So you can expect maybe somewhere around 200 miles wide is the actual storm. Those clouds, though, they, they are a lot larger. Looking from the on here. Okay, okay. I will. I will um, alert to that. We're just getting some uh, some information. Amanda was that the, the governor of Florida is about to address uh, and talk about that. So I, I guess Amanda, the plan will be to dip away and take that live here I, as well, right? I, I think that is what we are going to do here. We are going to take that live on WFLA. Um, WFLA's Evan just alerted us of that, that he is going to tease to that. The governor probably setting up here in just a few minutes. So that's a good time to kind of wrap up this hour long stream again. As Matt denoted earlier, our next full update coming in two hours at 11 a.m., and we will have that update here as well. Um, thanks, thanks, Trevor, uh, for joining us. This is KLFY's Trevor uh, Sonye joining us from La Louisiana there, and uh, we're kind of using the help from a lot of different meteorologists across the country right now because this is a busy time for us and we can't do it all here in Tampa. So thanks Trevor for joining us. I'm sure we've got, we still got a long way with hurricane season. I'm sure we'll see you again at some point on tracking the tropics, if not sooner in the next week or so, but I really appreciate you joining us and, and helping us out with this discussion this morning. Well, thanks for having me. And of course, Matt DiNardo helping us out here in Tampa as well. And we are going to continue to see Matt on, on later afternoon streams. I'm sure he'll be joining me at 11 a.m. So again, the governor is about to speak. We're going to take that live, uh, probably on Facebook, uh, probably on our app, as well as on WFLA's News Channel 8 on TV, on broadcast. So you can tune in, see the latest um, from his thoughts on these latest trends to see kind of maybe what their new plans are heading into the first half of the Labor Day weekend. Thank you guys, though, for joining us. Again, a new update coming at 11. We are going to be live uh, right at 11 with that update to give you guys the very latest. Until then, thanks for joining us.